Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Only one episode this week because of the um, Memorial Day holiday, and I hope that you all stuck with your diet. You didn't eat anything that Pam Popper wouldn't eat over the weekend. You don't have to report to me. You can just sort of self-analyze right now. All right, a couple of announcements. Um, the Food Over Medicine coaching program, my gosh, has that turned out to be popular. Um, I would love to tell you that we extended the special offer, the deep, deep discount. We didn't. Um, May 23rd was really the, de the deadline. But what we are going to do is tuition will increase about $150 every few weeks until we get to full tuition and then no more special offers. So if you wish you had done that, it is a little more expensive now, but you can buy it for a whole lot less than you will be buying it three weeks from now if you want to. So this is a program where we're hoping to lock arms with you to teach you some coaching skills and, and uh, teaching skills and to use some of our programs and, and uh, go out and start groups in your community and really partner with you to help others. All right, so if you want some information, send me an email. The other thing, the Diet, Lifestyle, and Intervention course starts next week, and that will be the official expiration of the spring offers on certification courses. So you've got one last try at all that. Uh, Pam Popper at msn.com is where you can email me for conversations. Any of you who want to talk about careers, I get emails every week. That's a wonderful thing. Keep them coming, all right? So a couple of things I wanted to update you on. Um, a few of you wrote to me and were asking about the vegan ketogenic diet. And there is such a thing. I think it is a ridiculous idea, and here's why. Um, if you look at the serious side effects of a ketogenic diet, and there are several, um, they are related to the amount of fat in the diet, not the type of fat. It is the amount of fat. So the vegan version of a ketogenic diet is a terrible idea unless you happen to have very special circumstances where the benefits that you can get outweigh the risks you're going to take. And the two most important ones are little kids who have epilepsy, preschool, toddlers, um, uh, young kids who have epilepsy because the ketogenic diet has been shown again and again to have a positive impact on epilepsy and sometimes putting it into remission. The other is when you have types of terminal cancer, like um, uh, certain types of brain cancers that are aggressive and result in death ra relatively quickly. Um, in those cases, the ketogenic diet can be helpful in keeping you alive. Um, uh, Tom Seafried from Boston University has some case reports uh, uh, that he talked to us about when he was in Columbus presenting a couple of years ago, where he's kept people alive for seven plus years using a ketogenic diet. Um, the consequences of the fat intake obviously outweighed by the benefit of staying alive when you would be dead within a year with the cancer that you have. So um, I did write an article with good references on this topic. It's in the Health Briefs Online Library. Um, you guys always complain that I don't post these on the website. Um, you, can, you can subscribe to the library. These kinds of things are free. Library, you have to spend a little bit of money. All right, uh, bottom line on this ketogenic diet, I think the pandering, I think it's pandering to come up with a vegan version of a, of a ketogenic diet instead of just saying, eating all that fat is a bad idea. Let us show you science that will um, allow you to see what a bad idea it is. So forget about vegan keto, forget about any kind of keto. If you're trying to lose weight or improve your health, why don't you look at adopting the type of diet that people who are healthier than you are, are eating every day. All right, um, another thing, I just wanted to give you a quick update. Yesterday, uh, I'm filming this on Wednesday, May 23rd. Um, yesterday, the right to try bill passed Congress and the president has promised to sign it. A lot of you emailed me about this issue. What does this really mean? Does this mean that finally cancer patients are going to get alternative medicine? It doesn't. What this really means is that drugs that have not yet been through clinical trials but show promise are going to be made available to uh, cancer patients if their doctors approve. Um, this is a step in the right direction. It is the beginning of the chipping away of the FDA and the drug company's stranglehold on drugs and profitability and treatment. I can see this leading to other things. I think it is a seminal moment in healthcare history, not because it, it's such a big game changer, but it's a small game changer that can lead to a lot of other positive changes. So um, for once in their lives, con con members of Congress got up off of their dead, dissenting rear ends and got something done in a bipartisan way. So let's, let's give them credit for that. 
And the president said from the beginning, he, he brought this up in his State of the Union address and said from the beginning he would sign this bill if these people would rally and get it done, and they did. So um, this is some progress, and there's much to celebrate. More to come on this, I'm sure. I'll keep you posted. All right. Um, I want to talk about nutrient testing as our topic for today, and it's kind of lengthy. And I guess I'll just start by saying that I think the beginning of the story is that the medical profession is obsessed with testing, and it's caused an enormous amount of enthusiasm for testing on behalf of consumers. There seems to be no end to the tests that are recommended, ranging from genetic testing to cancer screening. Very little of this activity has yield, yielded much in, the, in terms of positive results, and in fact, those of you who've been watching these videos for a long time know that that's a lot of what I talk about. With the exception of the PAP test, cancer screening results in a greater chance of harm than benefit for most people, and most of what's reported as a result of genetic testing is noise or completely irrelevant. Perhaps the most egregious example of the overuse of uh, testing is the billion dollar industry that's developed around vitamin D. It's not a vitamin, it's a hormone. There are no reliable testing methods. There is no consensus as to what optimal plasma levels of vitamin D should be. Nobody knows how much vitamin D you need to take in order to increase your plasma levels by a certain amount. There's no proven connection between higher plasma vitamin D levels and better health outcomes. Supplementation benefits very few people and there are known harms that can come from resulting, uh, that result from taking vitamin D supplements. So. I didn't provide all the references here. I mean, I've written 25 articles on vitamin D. They're posted in the Health Brace Library. But, but I mean, this is overwhelming, and it just doesn't seem to matter. Um, this has become a billion-dollar industry, and the people who have carved out their little piece of it are just not going to give it up. So it's not surprising that in the midst of this testing madness, and I think it is testing madness, some people think that they must have some type of testing performed to confirm that their plant-based diet or whatever diet they're on is working. Some members of the medical profession claim that testing for nutrient levels is a good way to evaluate the effect of one's diet and nutrient status. There are a lot of reasons that this is a bad idea, but let's start with the fact that there are thousands of nutrients in food. Which ones do you plan to be tested for? Well, I imagine vitamins and minerals for sure, but what about nutrients like ellagic acid or indole-3-carbinol or catechins or sulforaphane? Which ones are the most important? Which aren't? And why do you think that? Or why does somebody else think that? No one knows the answers to these questions, which is the, one of the reasons why nutrient tests can't yield very much in the way of promising or useful information. In addition to the uncertainty of which of the thousands of nutrients you're actually going to be tested for, testing is not a very precise science. One of the reasons is that human biochemistry is very complicated and it varies from minute to minute. This means that a test performed at 9.45 might show different results than a test performed at 10 o'clock. Um, fortunately, the body is able to respond to this type of variability by practicing what's called selective absorption, extracting and absorbing exactly what it needs from food at all times. Once in the body, there's even more variation as nutrients follow various pathways depending upon the body's needs at a particular time, energy versus cellular repair, for example. SpectraCell offers a test that evaluates nutrient status, and it's pretty popular with alternative practitioners. I went to the company's website, and the website information infers that part of taking control of one's health is finding out what your nutrient deficiencies are and then remedying them. The company claims that, quote, a balanced diet, exercise, and taking a multivitamin is, sim vitamin is simply not enough. SpectraCell's test evaluates levels of 35 nutrients in bl white blood cells, including vitamins, antioxidants, minerals, and amino acids. The company provides no reference for this statement, but claims that analyzing white blood cells is the most accurate way to identify deficiencies. Following the analysis, each patient is provided with a report listing their deficiencies and recommendations for supplements. Well, it's no wonder the alternative practitioners love this place. This is a way that you can sell supplements using some type of quote-unquote lab scientific test. To illustrate the futility of micronutrient testing, I thought instead of going nutrient by nutrient, let's just take one. Everybody's very concerned about their magnesium levels. Well, magnesium is an important nutrient. It's involved in a lot of functions, including glucose regulation, blood pressure, respiration, and bone health. Many people, most people, I should say, really can consume enough of it in food without trying very hard. The recommended daily allowance or RDA for adults who are 31 years of age and older is 420 milligrams a day for men and 320 for women. 
below is the magnesium content of just some common plant foods that I'll relate to you. Medium baked potato has 43, and I have the calories too in, in this article, so if you're a subscriber to the library, you can go look at this. But, but I took um, a medium baked potato, a cup of brown rice, a banana, a cup of black beans, a cup of cooked spinach, and that came up to 436 milligrams with 732 calories. So if you're eating like, I, I eat 3,000 calories a day. So I'm probably consuming a couple, three times the RDA for magnesium just by eating healthy foods all day long. I mean, one medium baked potato isn't a meal for me, like maybe four are, right? So a normal, a normal day's intake of calories will provide almost everybody with enough magnesium. There's just no reason to be concerned about that. And so it calls into question, why are we testing for magnesium levels, for example, if we really don't have a problem with deficiency? Well, some other issues. We don't know at this time exactly how magnesium levels in the cells are regulated. If we go outside the cells and we look at blood, blood magnesium levels, they're maintained within a very narrow range. And there are lots of regulatory mechanisms that make this happen, including parathyroid hormone, calcitonin, and insulin. In terms of measuring magnesium status, there's no accurate lab test that does this um, in terms of total body magnesium, but blood tests are the most common testing method. The spectrocell method of white blood cell analysis has been found to be generally inaccurate with intra-individual variation of between 12 and 22%. Intra-individual variation means the same person gets tested on different occasions. Well, a 12 to 22% vari variability doesn't really tell you much that's definitive. There's not much better in, in terms of results with red blood cell analysis for magnesium levels either. There are many confounding factors that uh, can affect magnesium levels. Magnesium absorption is controlled by several mechanisms, one of which is the selective absorption that I mentioned at the beginning of this, where um, your body's determining how much of something it needs at a given point in time. Another th some other issues are parathyroid hormone, vitamin D, dietary phytates, oxalate, phosphate, protein, potassium, and zinc. Levels are higher in the elderly. Serum, serum magnesium levels increase after short periods of intense exercise, but they decrease if you engage in a long period of endurance exercise. Levels are lower during the third trimester of pregnancy, but they're higher in people who eat a vegetarian or vegan diet. In addition to all of these variables, which can affect the test results, there's considerable variation in intra-individual measurements regardless of the testing method used. In other words, if a person shows up time and time again to have a test of the whatever test you're going to use, there's a lot of variation in what the results say, which really goes to what I said earlier, human biochemistry changes all the time. Total serum magnesium concentration is not the best way to evaluate magnesium status because so many different things can affect levels and the correlation between serum magnesium and total body magnesium status is quite poor. While magnesium deficiency is often noted in some diseases like hypertension or diabetes, there are really very few controlled studies that have confirmed any positive treatment result as a result of taking um, magnesium supplements. Magnesium is just one nutrient, and the variables are just as numerous for every other nutrient. In fact, there's more than this. I had to condense this down so that this talk didn't go on for two and a half days while we talk about all the different things that affect magnesium levels in the body. So just think about this. Spectrocells testing for, what, 35 nutrients? If we just looked at spectrocells test and the variability for all those nutrients, we would be here until next week talking about it. So here's what I'm coming to. There's not a lot of mileage or benefit from measuring specific nutrient status. I think the best test for evaluating your diet is to keep a food journal and write down everything you eat or drink for a few days, and then compare your journal to Wellness Farm Health's informed pyramid, um, or sit down and discuss it with somebody who knows a lot about optimal plant-based diets and see where you fit. It's really pretty easy to figure out for a lot of people. In fact, um, one thing that people say here is in the process of writing all this down, I pretty much figured out what was wrong with me. For example, eating brownies every afternoon, bad idea. Big salad at lunch, more of that, right? You don't have to have any degrees to figure that stuff out. And this is a whole lot more useful than figuring out how to tweak your resveratrol or anthocyanin intake. Diet quality is based on the foods that you eat, not transient nutrient levels, which usually have little to do with health status. Pay attention to what matters, the food. All right, well that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next week with more news.